Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 633, Post Pellet Instructions and the Possible Side Effects. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about anti aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. I'm Dr. Kathy Maupin, and my practice is BioBalance Health. Today, we're going to talk about uh, the information that we give our patients, every single patient. This is women's instructions. Uh, We have men's instructions as well. But we're going to talk about the women's instructions that we give our patients in writing and verbally when we're talking to them about getting pellets. Sometimes I think we should probably give these to our patients long before they get pellets so that they don't feel as nervous or worried about getting pellets because there's very little uh, that the patient has to do herself in regard to taking care of her hormones and she only has to come into the office every four months to get a refill on her hormone pellets. So we we get, we start out our handout basically with um, explaining that 95% of our patients don't have any problems and don't have any anything to even ask us about their pellets after they get them. We have um, we list this to make people feel better and to help them understand what they can expect after a pellet insertion. So we always tell our patients that we need to see them a little before four months on the on their second visit so that we don't uh, allow them to run out in case I have not figured out their dose appropriately. Usually it's just off a little bit and they may run out a few weeks early. So I generally see them at three and a half months instead of four on the very first visit. We ask our patients to get blood work before we even see them to see if they're candidates for pellets. And we have them get blood work one more time right before their second visit. And then they have a consultation with the doctor and for an hour to go over both their lab and their experience with pellets so that we can then determine a maintenance dose. So um, our pellet instruction sheet and the things that we talk about um, include um, the following things. I mean, these are just basic pellet instructions. When you have a pellet insertion, you have a little, a little cut or an incision with a, a, that's less than two millimeters in size. So you still have to take care of it like you had a surgical scar. So we ask you to, we put a pressure dressing on, we close the skin with a Steri-Strip, and the pressure dressing has to come off in three hours. Many people don't read this and they leave it on for three days and then their skin comes off with the tape. So I'm just saying, (laughs) please read this and listen to me. It comes off in three hours and the Steri-Strip the part that keeps the skin together comes off in three days. So that's very important. We don't want you taking it off before that or after. Before that, it may open back up. After, then it may take some, it may take some skin around the incision with it. So it's very important to do three hours, three days. Um, don't, so we tell the, our patients not to submerge themselves in a pool, a lake, a stream, a hot tub, a tub for three days until the skin is healed. It takes three days for normal incisions to heal, and this is a very tiny one, but it takes three days, so don't get in a tub for that amount of time. Now, we want our patients to exercise daily, but they get a reprieve after they get their pellets so they don't have to exercise for three days. In fact, I don't want them to exercise for three days because the pellets are settling into the fat tissue. They're, inje- they're inserted through the skin into the fat not into the muscle, not into the fascia, into the fat, where it can dis- they can dissolve. They dissolve in fat. So we have them have these pellets in that level. It's, it's somewhat superficial, but you usually can't feel them unless you're extremely skinny. So 
you can't check them and see what they're doing. But pellets have to settle into the fat because we don't want them moving around. We certainly don't want them going back up the line that we put them in because there is a little um, kind of a weakness there where or, or a path that they could move back. It's called expulsion. And so we don't want our patients to have expulsions and push the pellets out. We ha That's very rare now since we've changed some of our protocols. So it's very important that the patient not exercise for three days. So if they do, then they're at risk of making their pellets come back out, and then it's on them. But uh, we've also had patients who um, wore or, or went on a hike, didn't listen, and had a backpack that rubbed on his pellets, and that caused them to just work their way out and be bruised, and it was painful. So no backpacks, no gun belts. If you have a gun belt, if you're a, an officer, then tell us so that we can put it in your love handles or someplace that your, that your gun belt doesn't rub because that could cause them to come out too. Um, we ask that you don't, that you keep your incision clean after you take your, your pressure dressing off, that you're not doing anything that's extremely dirty <laughs> that can get into the incision. You also have to, um, Use ice packs for the first 12 hours. We give you an ice pack. You can use ice packs at home to keep the swelling down. And uh, it will also decrease the bruising that you might have. When we put pellets in the fat, we can't see tiny little capillaries. So it's often that we might hit a capillary and it might bleed into the, into the fat and the skin, and that causes a bruise. That's more common in men because they get many more pellets than women do but it still can happen in women. I've probably had it happen over the last 20 years, getting pellets every four months. Uh, I've probably had it happen three times that accidentally we hit a little tiny blood vessel and I got a bruise, but it's a bruise, it goes away. Um, we ask that our patients not take systemic steroids if they can help it. Uh, that's like Medrol dose pack or prednisone because that can decrease the healing. And our patients who are on that all the time, we ask them to stay, they stay on it, but they wait to take their uh, steroid strip off for a few extra days so that we can make sure they heal. Steroids slow healing. Um, let's see. We also ask our patients to, um, be, for a whole different reason, to avoid systemic steroids, not it's okay if they get an injection into the joint as long as it doesn't get outside the joint and circulate. But steroids have a different effect in terms of the testosterone and the estrogen levels. Steroids cause them to be bound up and inactivated. So we don't want our patients to have steroids when they are getting pellets because it can decrease the um, reversal of all their symptoms. So that's very important. If you have to have steroids, it's life and death, then you have to have steroids and you're just going to have to have your pellets sooner. But if you can avoid it, I always ask if, if my uh, friend, my rehab doctor, Dr. Yadava says, oh, you can take steroids for this for a couple weeks. I'm like, mm, what's my second choice? And that's because I don't want my pellets to be inactivated. So he usually gives me a second choice. Um, so the, the issues that might happen immediately, um, is that when we give pellets, we usually use lidocaine to numb you up, and we use some lidocaine with epi, epinephrine, and some lidocaine without it. Now, in cases of people with arrhythmias, heart problems, glaucoma, other reasons that there are several other reasons why you can't take uh, epinephrine because it speeds your heart up, it may speed your heart up. Uh, but we, but you can feel that sometimes. You can feel like you're a little anxious or a little shaky from the epinephrine. Now, we want to be told about that, but this goes away very quickly. So within an hour, in general, it's gone, and it doesn't have you. It doesn't leave any lasting problems. But please tell us, and then the next time we won't add the, lid the lidocaine with epi. We'll just use plain lidocaine, and what that does is it increases your risk of bruising but you don't have that same kind of anxious feeling or shaky feeling. Um, other immediate problems are some patients can um, bump their incision after they get home and they can actually cause bleeding. 
And if that's the case, we have you use pressure and ice to try to stop it. And then in only one case that I know of, in somebody who was on a blood thinner, um, she bumped her hip on a, on a kitchen counter. And she had to go to the emergency room and have a stitch put in, in that incision. But we've been doing this for 20 years, and, and there's only one case that I know of. So you, in general, the clot will, if you put pressure on it and ice, your body will clot within seven minutes and you should be okay. You just put another dressing on it and go about your business. Like um, dressing means some four by four gauze folded up over, over the um, tiny little incision. And then you put tape over that kind of tightly to keep it some pressure on it. And that's what I call a dressing that comes off again in three days. Um, if you have bruising, it's ugly, but it's not dangerous. Um, the bruising usually is gone by seven, seven days. So, um, you can massage it after that to kind of move around the hemosiderin that's been deposited by your blood. And that will help you get rid of your bruise faster. If you have problems with clotting, like in the bleeding problem or in the bruising, you can take uh, vitamin K, 100 micrograms, uh, and you can take it one or two of those tablets that you can get at any health food store. Vitamin K helps you stop bleeding. Don't do that if you're on warfarin or if you are on a blood thinner, but you can do that in any other case. It's very safe. Um, now, some symptoms happen after three days. So in general, nobody gets an infection from any kind of incision within the first 24 or 48 hours because infections don't work like that. So an infection usually will show itself by weeping kind of a yellow or thick white or thick yellow um, drainage and swelling, redness, and heat. So that's what looks like an infection. If you don't, if it's not very severe, if it's minor, you can clean it with hydrogen peroxide, uh, half and half with sterile water, and then you put a large Band-Aid over it, or uh, you can take a picture of it and send it to our nurse, and our nurse will then be able to tell pretty much by you answering some questions and by her looking at it, whether you need to have it have have it cleaned by our office, have you come in, we clean it, we then, um, and make sure that there's no infection left there, and then we give you oral antibiotics or a shot of rocephin, which is an antibiotic. So that's how we handle it. It's not the end of the world, and it does get better, but if that's the case, we if you just get a spontaneous infection from skin bacteria of your own, then we usually will uh, pre-treat you with antibiotics. Uh, expulsion, if you push your pellets back out, then if you can see them, they're little teeny tiny white things, then bring them, you know, collect them and hang on to them. And then we can see you at the office when, the next day that we're open. And we'll look at what came out to see if it really is a pellet or not and we'll look at your incision. Some people think their pellets came out and they really, nothing happened. They just felt like something came out, but it didn't. And so we can even ultrasound you to prove that your pellets are still in there. Um, if you get redness and itching and swell, swelling, but no heat, you generally, it might be an allergy to the pellets themselves or to the lidocaine. So we usually change pharmacies the next time. And we treat you with Zyrtec for a week to two weeks to decrease the allergy. And, and generally, that takes care of it. You don't have that the whole four months. Scarring. Some people scar very thickly, like keloids, or they just get thick scars or red scars or piled up scars. So if that is you, we like to know that ahead of time, and then we can give you your pellets and treat you with a tiny bit of a corticosteroid we can inject around the incision. That will delay healing a few days, but it will keep you from getting over healing and getting keloids or getting a thick scar because after you've done this for a while, if you scar every time, you're going to have lots of little dots all over your hips. So we try to prevent scarring by making our instruments smaller than other people's. We've had them retooled and they're narrower so we can make a two millimeter or smaller incision. In general, two millimeter incisions don't scar heavily and they don't leave a mark 
later. That's why laparoscopes, when if you've ever had a laparoscope and they, they put little cuts all over your abdomen so that they can use instruments through those um, openings, if you've ever had that, you know that they're very tiny and they just disappear. You can't find the scar later. That's because they're two millimeters or less. So that's what we, knowing that, and my having been a surgeon, I know that, then that helped us decide how to t retool our insertion devices. So we make them narrower, smaller, so they'll fit through two millimeters to prevent you from having uh, having a scar. So that's the, the prevention part. If you are a scar former, we can use some steroids on it, and that should help decrease your response to having a, an incision. Um, the things that are transient that can happen in the first in the very beginning of your pellets that always just goes away. One is that you can feel after about two weeks you can feel too much sex drive, such that that's all you think about. But it doesn't last very long. It's usually a week or so, and maybe two weeks. And then after that, you still have a better sex drive than you did before the pellets, but it goes to, it should go to your normal sex drive. If we've dosed you properly, it should go back to what you had when you were in your 30s. Not when you were 18, which is, we always have almost too much sex drive when we're, when we're in our teens. So we don't want you to be over sex, we just want you to be your normal uh, for sexual uh, desire. Uh, many of our patients who haven't had estrogen or testosterone for years, they're, they're well past 50 years old, um, get severe vaginal itching. It is not an infection. It's not yeast. It's not bacteria. It's not something that you need an antibiotic for. It is blood flow being stimulated by testosterone and estrogen going back to your pelvis. And that blood flow going to your pelvis activates these little tiny nerves that have not had a lot of oxygenization, have not been stimulated in a long time. The hormones bring that back and it doesn't last that long, but the only thing that we've found that really fixes it is ice, applying ice to the area. Other than that, um, Benadryl kind of creams might help, but and you can take Benadryl, but it is not an allergy, it is not an infection. It is just blood flow, which is what you want, but it's your body getting used to the new level of testosterone. Facial hair is a side effect of testosterone, no matter how you get it. Um, if you had facial hair when you were young and you are, um, that, then you're at risk for getting it again when we give you your testosterone to bring back your normal levels. So we give our patients spironolactone. It is a diuretic, but off-label, it stops acne, it prevents acne, and it prevents facial hair. You may get one hair, but you're not going to have to get waxed or lasered or, or something as uh, expensive and invasive as that. Um, so basically, if you take your spironolactone, then that decreases your chance of getting facial hair and acne. Some people believe that their hair is thinning with testosterone, and in general, that's not the cause. Usually hair thinning all over your head is uh, either high cortisol or it is low thyroid and T3 thyroid. So when somebody tells us that their hair is thinning, uh, that's not going to happen from testosterone insertions of pellets in the first three months anyway. But testosterone hair loss is generally at the temples and at the top of the head. So in this case, I would be checking your DHT level, which tells me if you have a high level of a byproduct of testosterone that stimulates your facial hair and acne, or, and I'm also going to check your thyroid and your cortisol level, because it might be one of those other problems that this, this just reactivated or caused you to, um, caused you to notice it because you were thinking, oh, testosterone, it must be my testosterone because I just got it. Most of the people who tell me that testosterone, they think testosterone is causing hair loss, are people who had hair loss before they ever started testosterone. And, and, we may not have them on the right thyroid dose yet. It may, we may not have worked our way up to the right thyroid dose. So it's usually that. Last but not least is a, um, is a very 
subtle change in your voice. Now, some people believe that testosterone replacement will cause your voice to drop. And if, and it does in some people who are extremely sensitive or in singers. People who are singers need to tell us so that we will not give you as much testosterone as we would give somebody else. Because even that little tiny change in their voice can make a big difference to them. Now, for people who are speaking, in general, it, it doesn't change your speaking voice. And if you feel like your voice is changing, oftentimes you're looking for that to change and it is reflux or it, I mean, you can reflux all the way to your vocal cords or you are, you're dehydrated and your voice changes when you're dehydrated. But in general, it is not testosterone. There's been several studies um, by a um, doctor in Ohio who did studies on pellets, testosterone pellets, and she found that the voice did not get lowered by testosterone, even in high doses, but that it was usually related to something else. I think the only people who are really, um, really do have some effect are, the, are people who sing. And that's because they can't handle any little tiny bit of a change in their voice. And I understand that. We, we are sympathetic to that and we'll work with you for that. Um, some people think that testosterone causes you to gain weight, but in pellet form, it, it only causes you to gain muscle. It should cause you to trade fat for muscle. So your weight may not change at all, but your size will at the very beginning. In general, weight does not go up from testosterone unless it's muscle weight. So on the flip side of that, it is not a license to go out and eat whatever you want or drink whatever you want because you're on testosterone thinking you're going to lose weight because that's not going to work. You'll gain muscle, you won't lose fat, and then you will have a, a higher weight. You may even have a higher size if you're not following your diet anymore just because you're on testosterone. So that's very important to know. If you feel like <clears throat> estrogen is causing you to have... Um, swollen breasts, belly fat, which it could, but usually doesn't in this form because it's not oral. Um, we, we use DIM, D-I-M, diindole methane, which is a supplement. And we usually use 150 to 300 milligrams a day with food. So that can actually help. If it really is an issue, we'll decrease your estrogen dose the following time. Um, Testosterone does not cause urinary tract infections. Testosterone gives you a sex drive, so you have more sex, which then can cause bladder infections or urinary tract infections. So if that happens, you need to remember to pee before and after intercourse. You may use a baby wipe before intercourse because you want to keep all the bacteria that is always sitting on our perineums away from your bladder. And when you have sex, it pushes it back into the bladder. So that's where the urinary tract infection um, myth comes from. Um, estradiol can cause uterine bleeding. We've talked about this last week because we talked about fibroids. So uterine bleeding can happen from fibroids. It can cause fibroids to grow. Or um, estradiol can, can, if you don't take your progesterone every day, it can cause a thickening of the lining of the uterus, which is not healthy. And for that, we usually send our patients back to their gynecologists to have either a DNC or a biopsy of the lining to make sure it's not cancerous or precancerous and to clean it out, hopefully. Uh, and then most of our patients realize what the downside of not taking their progesterone every night is and they start being more compliant or uh, we change the kind of progesterone and we ask them to get a Mirena IUD, which goes into the uterus and actually secretes progesterone directly into the uterine uh, cavity which keeps the lining very thin. Um, vaginal discharge. In general, after menopause, vaginas are very dry. They don't have a lot of uh, lubricant. They don't have a lot of swelling. Uh, they are uh, just there. But after you get estrogen and testosterone back, you'll notice that you have more 
discharge like you did when you were younger because it's giving you back the hormones you had when you were young and fertile. So that discharge uh, is just back to a younger age. It is not dangerous. It is not an infection. Um, most people feel better mood-wise on testosterone and, and estrogen. In general, anxiety and depression do not get worse. They often get better. But I don't want my patients going off their antidepressant until we can prove that they are no longer depressed <laughs> because they've gotten estrogen, testosterone, or even thyroid. That helps mood. But if you go off of these, uh, what you have been on for a long time, you have to wean off. So you have to go to the doctor that gave it to you in the beginning to wean you off. And I need to have you change nothing else so that I know what is due to your hormones and what is due to another medication or the lack of the other medication. So I don't want my patients to go off their anxiety and depression medicine in the first four months at least. Um, migraine headaches. Migraine headaches are usually improved with testosterone, but estro some people have estrogen-stimulated migraines, and it's really not about the estrogen itself. It's about the uh, estrogen going up and then dropping right before a period, and that's when the headache happens. In general, uh, pellets make migraines better, not worse. So that's a myth that migraines get worse on pellets, on estrogen and testosterone. So these are the things that can happen after you get pellets. And we give you a complete rundown of these risks, both in your consent, but also here in, in the handout that we give you that I do want you to read. It is much more specific than what we've just talked about. So this is something that um, is very important just in general. If a doctor gives you a handout to read, don't just throw it in a pile on your desk. You should read it. There is going to be information in there that he or she did not have time to tell you the nuances of. And you need to know when you start a new treatment that this treatment is safe. And you need to know how to be safe. So you have to read this handout because otherwise you're not going to know what to expect and everything's going to be an emergency and you're going to make yourself more anxious and you're going to call the office going, this happened to me and I don't know why. Well, we had it in the handout. We had it in the consent. We talked to you about it. Please refer to it. And if you read it ahead of time, then you, you decrease your anxiety. So that is part of what is in our in our handouts, we have other things in, in the handout right after you have your pellets, but that is the most important part. And uh, I hope this helped you not be so worried about getting your hormones with pellets. I mean, it's much more effective than any other way to get hormones. You aren't at risk for having a blood clot or having a heart attack because you're not taking oral, you're taking non-oral hormones. And you actually are decreasing your risk of getting all the diseases of aging, like heart attack, stroke, and diabetes, by taking the pellets and following our treatment plan. So I hope this helped you. Sometimes hearing it is better than just reading it for people. So um, remember to always read what your doctor gives you. Read the instructions on your on your um, prescriptions so that you know how your doctor wanted you to take them. But in this case, read this so you know what to expect. Thank you for listening today. I hope this helped you. I hope you see us next week and we will be finding some other cutting edge information that will help you in your uh, travel through menopause or premenopause. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth.